My name is Casey Burgett, and I'm here representing the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, which is a joint venture between R Street Institute, where I work, and the New America Foundation. We have a, a left of center and a right of center think tank purposefully to have foster conversations exactly like the one we're going to have today about how to make Congress work just a little bit better. So we're excited to, to co-sponsor this event with Dr. William Murray and the Good Government Now group, and I'll turn it over for him to him to, uh, to get this party started. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Casey. Appreciate it. I'm Bill Murphy, uh, president of Good Government Now. Very excited to be working with uh, Ledge Branch and Casey, Kevin Kozar, Lee Drutman have all done a great job. Uh, and certainly with our fabulous panelists here who will consider uh, a rule on information requests and subpoenas proposed by, uh, by Michael Stern. Uh, we'll start off the panel with uh, a presentation from Stan Brand on the, the history of the current uh, crisis in oversight. Stan, uh, as you know, is a senior counsel with Aiken Gump, a former uh, House uh, general counsel. Uh, after Stan outlines a little bit of the history, Mike Stern, who is a, a senior fellow with Good Government Now, a former uh, a veteran of House service in the uh, as a senior legal counsel in the general counsel's office, also as a, st a deputy staff director uh, for investigations for the Senate Committee on uh, Homeland Security and, and Government Affairs. He's also been a special counsel for the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on, on Intelligence. After Mike outlines uh, his proposal, we'll hear uh, commentary from Michael Bopp and Elise Bean. Uh, Michael is a partner at Gibson Dunn. He's a former staff director and chief counsel for the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs. Elise, of course, is the uh, Washington co-director of the Levin Center uh, at Wayne uh, State University Law School. She, too, is a former uh, staff director and chief counsel to the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the uh, Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. She also happens to be the author of a fabulous book, Financial Exposure, that uh, we should all uh, <clears throat> check out based on her exciting years working with Senator uh, Levin. Uh, so I think now uh, Stan will, uh, will start us off. Stan, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, as by far the oldest one in the room, I get to set the table, if you will. But before I do, my old uh, uh, boss and mentor, Speaker Tip O'Neill, always told me to warm the crowd up with a story. Um, when I was general counsel to the House in the 80s, there was a woman named Madeline Murray O'Hare who uh, some of you, well, no, you're all too young. Um, but she brought a series of cases to uh, uh, ban public pr uh, prayer in public schools. Um, and then in the 80s, she turned, and she turned her attention to the House chaplain, who she decided was an unconstitutional establishment of religion, and she brought a lawsuit against the House and the chaplain and the leadership, and it felt to me to defend the case. And at some point, it went before an inbound court of appeals here in D.C., and uh, it was a very emotionally highly charged case. And actually, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was on the court at that time. And the chaplain accompanied me to the hearing. And he was very nervous, obviously, because his job was on the line. And the argument went pretty well, although it was very contentious. Um, and we were leaving the courthouse. And the chaplain grabbed me by the sleeve. And he said, you know, how, how do you think it went? And I said to him, you know, chaplain, it's a sad day when a man of the cloth has to turn to a lawyer to be saved. <laughs> um, we, we did save him. So I'm, I'm going to set the table by explaining how some of what we're going to be discussing today really started, and why it's become a problem, and how this uh, proposal may help us um, make the process more responsive and more efficient. And I'm going to start with the case that I litigated when I was in the House's counsel, uh, a contempt citation brought against the then administrator of the EPA, Ann Gorsuch. Yes, that Gorsuch, the mother of the chief, the new Supreme Court justice. Um, several committees in the House subpoenaed records from the EPA on the administration of the Superfund law. The, uh, to make that part of the story short, the uh, administration through the Department of Justice, raised executive privilege and other matters. Um, the case went through the House. 
Uh, eventually, the committee, the Public Works Committee, uh, brought a report to the House floor to hold the administrator in contempt and refer her to the Department of Justice for prosecution under the statute 2 U.S.C. 192, which is the criminal contempt statute that's been on the books since 1857, I believe, I don't know if this is right, that she may have been the highest ranking executive branch official to actually have been referred for prosecution at the time. By the way, to demonstrate how long ago this was, the vote was a bipartisan vote with 70 Republicans joining almost all the Democrats to send it to, uh, to, the, uh, to the U.S. attorney. Um, at the time of the vote on the House floor at about 10 o'clock uh, one night, uh, we were just about to vote, and we were informed that simultaneously the Department of Justice was filing a lawsuit in the District of Columbia Federal Court uh, seeking an injunction and declaratory relief that the referral was unconstitutional, that it was a uh, abridgment of the president's uh, executive privilege claims, uh, was inappropriate for resolution under the criminal statute and a bunch of other claims. And rather than uh, present the matter to the grand jury as the statute, at least on its face, appears to make mandatory by using the ter term shall, decided not to present it to the grand jury and instead to file a lawsuit and try to resolve the matter through a civil uh, process. Um, our, our view at the time, and to some extent, I suppose it's still my own view, um, we moved to dismiss the case based on a number of jurisdictional grounds. It went before a district judge, John Lewis Smith, uh, and he ruled in a case famously titled, in an Alice in Wonderland way, United States versus United States House of Representatives, if you can if you can get your head around that as a, as a separation of powers person and someone who teaches uh, at Penn State Dickinson School of Law, there's a number of ambiguities and oddities about that title, but I'll leave that for another day. Um, the case was dismissed by the judge who found that the statute was an orderly and effective means of resolving the case, that any claim that the administrator had or that the Justice Department had on her behalf could be resolved in the course of a criminal case. Uh, and that, you know, the parties ought to go back and work this out, but he wasn't going to entertain the lawsuit, at which point there was no appeal sought by the department. Uh, the the uh, White House intervened through um, Deputy Attorney General Ed Schmaltz, uh, we negotiated a resolution of the document fight. The committee got access to the documents under a procedure that's not uh, particularly relevant here. And that was the end of the case. Um, what, what that spawned, that, that began a, I think, slow erosion of the notion that the House had available to it the statute is a means of enforcing subpoenas against executive branch officials. Um, not, that long, not long thereafter, uh, the position became institutionalized, I think, through the Office of Legal Counsel and, and through subsequent Democratic as well as Republican Justice Departments that 2 U.S.C. 192 was not a device that the department would ever use against a uh, executive branch official who asserted privilege on the instruction of the president in a, in a document dispute with the House. So what, be, what started as a um, novel legal theory that the Department of Justice could subjugate the interests of the House to its own parochial position on executive privilege and deny the House access to federal courts under the statute became the de rigueur and the institutional position of the Department of Justice. Now, why is that important here? I think it's important here because it begins a process of, of erosion 
and begins a process of, of Department of Justice resistance to congressional subpoenas, knowing that whoever is in charge of the Justice Department, Democrat or Republican, they're never going to bring a case under 2 U.S.C. 192 to enforce the subpoena. So a, a element of congressional uh, enforcement power is removed. Now, there were all kinds of proposals after that to uh, statutorily change the contempt uh, provisions to have an independent counsel and all kinds of other things. That, that never went anywhere. That case, I believe, uh, and the irony of that was that what had been uh, invented in the Reagan administration as a way to resist congressional subpoenas was very quickly adopted by Democratic administrations. And so what the House was forced to do was, in fact, appropriate the theory that we had rejected in the Gorsuch case itself to bring a case against Harriet Myers when the House Judiciary Committee was investigating the firing of the U.S. attorneys in 2006 or 7. So the irony is the theory that we exploded in the Gorsuch case actually became a theory adopted by the House majority at the time to try to get uh, compliance with the subpoenas. And of course, uh, the, the irony of that was, the further irony of that is, when the House of Representatives went to court, a la the Gorsuch case, to seek enforcement of its subpoena in a civil action, which had been authorized by the, by the full House, the Department of Justice met that argument with all the arguments that we had used against them in 1983. It wasn't ripe, it wasn't a case of controversy, it wasn't authorized, it wasn't constitutional, on and on and on. So the positions became uh, reversed. Now, um, so, so what, what that case pretended was part of the problem and stalemate that I think uh, we have today. And, and to, to, to wrap up on this, um, I believe, I can't prove this, but I believe that this has leached into even the department's attitude towards use of the statute against non-governmental witnesses. And the case in point that I give for that is the, the famous or infamous, depending on your view, Lois Lerner case. And I don't know how many of you will remember that. Lois Lerner was head of the IRS, a uh, division that did um, uh, charitable uh, exemption uh, applications. And she was subpoenaed in the course of the uh, House Oversight Committee's investigation of that uh, contratop. And she uh, asserted the Fifth Amendment, although before she asserted the Fifth Amendment, she gave a little speech about why she was innocent, and she wanted very much to testify, but she couldn't because her lawyers advised her not to. And the majority took the position that she'd waived her privilege. Now, in the old days, and by the old days, I mean even the days preceding me, in the 50s and 60s, uh, during the Red Scare and all the House on American Activities cases, the way normally these certifications were received by the department or the U.S. attorney was almost an automatic, an automatic presentation to the grand jury. Uh, deference to the Congress, deference to the statute, and the department's position was generally, look, if you have a beef about the congressional procedure or the rules as a respondent in a contempt case, tell it to the court. We're just going to put this in front of the grand jury we're going to make a, and, and, and by the way, it's very easy to make those cases because the elements of the offense aren't complicated and the burden in the grand jury is not what it is at trial. It's probable cause. You present it to the grand jury. I mean, you know, a caveman could do it, to bar, pardon a phrase. And the court would have to decide all these issues. So what happened in the Lois Lerner case? Well, there was a dispute about waiver of Fifth Amendment. The case gets to the U.S. attorney on referral, on certification from the House. And he decides, sua sponte, he's not going to present it to the grand jury. Why? Because he has reviewed 
the issue of the Fifth Amendment waiver case and decided that she didn't waive it and no reasonable attorney within the Justice Department could take a contrary position and therefore he's not going to present it to the grand jury. Now, <clears throat> just as a matter of law, not as a matter of you know how you feel about that case or that investigation, um, I believe that's evidence of the fact that we are even further along in the frustration that the House has, who's ever in power, in enforcing its subpoenas, because now there's a total breakdown in the deference that, that the Justice Department pays to the House of Representatives when it passes a contempt resolution. And I think that has spawned progeny in the form of some of the delays <clears throat> and some of the obfuscation that goes on, which, uh, which Mike's proposal is designed to truncate and eliminate. So, you know, that's, that's the history of how we got here. Um, the last point I'll make is that, again, in the old days, the bipartisan nature of oversight was a given. So in the Gorsuch case, when it came time to bring it to the floor, and it was reported out of committee with only one Republican vote in favor, a guy named Mark Lincoln Marks from Pennsylvania. Um, but by the time it got to the floor, it was being championed by none other than Henry Hyde on the Republican side. So, so that was the old days. In the Myers case, and I believe in the Fast and Furious case, there was no uh, bipartisan support for either of those. And I think that's added to the department's inclination to not take seriously referrals of noncompliance with, with House subpoenas. So at this point, I'm going to conclude and, and get to the, to the nub, which is Mike's proposal, which I think does address some of the, some of the uh, effects and some of the lingering problems with what developed uh, all those years ago in the Gorsuch case. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming out on this uh, very rainy day. Uh, I have a PowerPoint, which is going to be a little difficult for about half the room to see, but I'll try not to uh, make you spend too much time looking at it. Uh, so uh, let's see. About 20 years ago, a law professor by the name of Neil Devins wrote an article, I think was titled something like uh, Congressional executive information disputes, a modest proposal, do nothing. And uh, at that time, that might have seemed like a reasonable proposal uh, in the sense that the frustrations that Stan uh, has identified that began in the 1980s and continued through the 1990s, at least at that point, uh, could usually be worked out in a political uh, way, if not a legal way. But as Stan has mentioned, uh, this situation has just gotten progressively worse, and particularly with the lack of uh, any kind of bipartisanship in, uh, in Congress. The fact is that there's really no uh, way often of resolving these contentious disputes uh, short of some something other than doing nothing. So the proposal that is on the table today, hopefully I'll be able to work this thing. So first of all, we identify the problem, which is, uh, Stan has mentioned, we have no reliable enforcement mechanism for congressional subpoenas to the executive branch. We have a mechanism that works for private parties, which is the contempt citation, uh, a vote of the House or Senate, uh, and uh, and then referral to the U.S. Attorney. But when it comes to a, a contempt citation against the executive branch, as Chairman Gowdy remarked a few years ago, the U.S. Attorney is an unlikely ally for Congress. And so there really is no effective enforcement mechanism. Part 
partially as a consequence of that, there's also, also no uh, effective incentive for agencies to comply with congressional deadlines, right? To the contrary, Congress is only two years. The normal process of investigation starts with document requests, then you move on to witness interviews, uh, then you would go to a hearing, and then a report. So the longer you can drag out the initial phase of that, the document request, uh, from the agency's perspective, maybe the committee will get interested in something else and move on, or at the very least, you will be able to significantly truncate its a the time it has to do its work. So there's a disincentive, really, for agencies to comply with congressional deadlines. Uh, the current process also places asymmetric burdens on the, uh, on the committee itself, because uh, while the agency can stall as long as it wants, uh, it's really the burden is on the committee to go forward. And under the current process, there's no way of uh, enforcing a subpoena absent a vote of the House. And, and by the way, many of the remarks I'm making today are also uh, applicable to the Senate, but we're talking about a House rule in large part because it's even harder to get a rule through the Senate than it is at, in, through the House. Uh, but in, in either case, you have, have, have a vote of the full body in order to proceed with contempt, and then even then you have no uh, guarantee that, it, that it's going to work. So essentially, if a, if a committee chairman or a member of a committee that is trying to get information from the executive branch wants to move forward with, with uh, holding the uh, agency accountable under current rules, basically you have to socialize the issue with the leadership, with other members of the body, and you have to sink a lot of member time into that with no guarantee of payoff. Uh, and so, and then finally, uh, civil enforcement uh, as, uh, We'll hear a little bit later, uh, particularly I think Michael Bopp will uh, be covering this, but civil enforcement as it stands now is a risky and time-consuming proposition. So how, how are we going to try to address that? Uh, first of all, we're going to try to provide an orderly and regularized process for uh, requesting documents, making objections, and resolving disputes and try to establish consistent deadlines with consequences for default. We're going to try to make the executive branch accountable, uh, including the president, uh, accountable for making objections or asserting privilege in writing. And we're going to empower the committee of the House that is making the document request and issuing the subpoena uh, to bring, under the correct circumstances, a civil enforcement action that will be streamlined in nature. So this is probably the part of the presentation you may want to look at, but I apologize for those of you who have to crane your neck. So I've tried to flow chart this to make it a little easier to understand, and I have two charts. The first uh, is uh, dealing with the, the initial stage from document request to subpoena. Uh, so, the, so there's basically two tracks. If the, uh, it starts out with the committee issuing a document request to the agency. If the agency makes a timely objection to the, uh, to the document request, and obviously at any stage it can also comply with the document request and solve the dispute that way, but assuming the agency does not want to comply either in part or in full with the document request, it would make a timely objection, and then there would be a period of negotiation between the committee and the agency to try to work out uh, whatever the problems are, hopefully to resolve those disputes amicably if possible. If, those, if it cannot be worked out, then we would move to a process where the committee may issue a subpoena, uh, which means either the chairman with the consent of the ranking member or the committee itself in a meeting would vote to issue the uh, subpoena. On the other hand, if the agency does not provide, does not make a timely objection, the chairman would be authorized unilaterally to issue the subpoena without any period of negotiation. Now, under current practice, uh, for most House committees, the chairman already has that authority. So we're not really giving the chairman more authority than, than they have now. 
but rather we're giving the agency an incentive to, uh, to make a timely objection and actually get more process than it would be entitled to under current rules. Now we move on to the subpoena stage, uh, and again, there'll be two tracks. One, if the agency makes a timely objection, there would be a committee hearing to resolve those objections uh, and to rule on the objections. That is somewhat different than the process that exists today because uh, under current practice, normally a committee, if it issues a subpoena uh, and, and the subpoena recipient, whether it's an agency or a private party, makes an objection, the chairman, uh, the chair, will normally rule on that objection. Then, if the committee wants to go forward with, with assuming that the party does not comply with the chairman's ruling, and the committee wants to go forward with contempt, there has to be a uh, meeting of the committee to vote on contempt. But the chair already having ruled, there is certainly a gravitational force there for the committee, at least the committee majority, to go along with what the chairman has already ruled. This would give the committee itself the opportunity to uh, consider the objections in the first instance, and that gives the agency a more level playing field than it, than it perhaps has today. Uh, assuming that the committee rules in whole or in part against the agency, there would be an order of compliance issued. Uh, that would give the agency a period of time during which one of two things could happen. One is that the uh, agency could comply. Uh, the other is that the president, in writing, could assert executive privilege. And we'll get to in a minute in, uh, why that's important. If, if either of those things happen, if, if the president, uh, obviously if the agency complies, that ends the dispute. If the president asserts executive privilege, then nothing further under this rule would happen from a litigation standpoint the committee would still have all of the remedies that it has under current rules and laws. Uh, it, we also have the, uh, the rule mentions the possibility of political remedies such as appropriations or even impeachment. Uh, but if the president asserted executive privilege, uh, that would end the dispute as far as uh, legal enforcement under this rule. On the other hand, if the president does not assert executive privilege and the agency does not comply within the time period provided, the committee would be authorized under the rule to proceed immediately to court to, to enforce the subpoena. Uh, and there would be no further vote of the House required, so the committee would not have to uh, try to get a, uh, all the other members of the House to vote uh, and to bring this to the floor. And going back to the initial issue of the subpoena, if the agency does not uh, comply with the time deadlines, it, it does not either comply with the subpoena or uh, make a uh, objection in a timely fashion, then again the committee would be authorized to go to court. Uh, so this would place quite a bit of uh, incentive on the, on the part of the agency to comply with these deadlines at the very least because there are serious consequences for failing to, uh, for failing to do so. So the advantages of the proposed rule uh, are, number one, they provide a, a roadmap for the committee. So the uh, committee staff can understand and project what happens at each stage of the process. It will also provide a process under which the uh, initial demands of the committee will be refined and hopefully sharpened through the negotiation process and the subpoena stage. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, it's very common for the initial stages of an, of an investigatory request to be very, very broad. And often there are legitimate objections or reasons why the agency cannot uh, reasonably be expected to comply with everything. Under, you know, certainly that those things do get negotiated today, but this would provide a more orderly fashion, a more orderly process by which those, uh, those uh, issues would be uh, hopefully refined and put the committee in a stronger position if it does end up in court. And again, the, because you do not need a vote of the House, 
you would not have to have the, uh, the burden on member time that's involved today if you want to really enforce a subpoena. We are also providing uh, an element of congressional due process here for, to the agency, and I've already discussed that, right? We've given them, uh, we've given them uh, specific time deadlines, we've given them this negotiation period, we've given them the ability to appear at a hearing uh, at which their objections are considered, and uh, we are uh, basically giving them fair notice which is something that does not necessarily happen uh, under current law. Uh, so uh, I think we have here some uh, quotes from Professor Wright wrote an article a few years ago that, was, that I found very interesting called Congressional Due Process. And basically he's talking about this issue of how in, uh, in the current process there is no real clear method for uh, responding to subpoenas or when, how you make objections, when you make objections, how they're going to be resolved. Uh, and I think he's correct that by giving some additional process, uh, the Congress will actually enhance its legitimacy of its oversight requests and certainly strengthen its position uh, if, it, if and when it has to go to court. Okay, so, uh, so we mentioned the deadlines uh, and a, Again, the, uh, I think we've covered those both for the objection initially to the uh, document request and the subpoena. There are consequences if you miss the deadlines. Uh, and, and also the president is required specifically to assert executive privilege at a, sp a specific time. As things can't stand now, the president can wait however long he wants. If the issue is, if the case is actually brought to court, there's nothing saying that he can't assert executive privilege at that point. And that is, of course, makes things even more difficult from the standpoint of enforcement. Again, we've provided for accountability. The agency is required under the rule to designate a senior responsible official who, if possible, will be a civil officer subject to impeachment. And that official is required to personally make, respond to the subpoena and the document request, responsible for coming to the hearing uh, on, on the objections. And again, the president is required personally to assert executive privilege. So finally, the advantages of this process will be found in what, the, what will happen, hopefully, uh, if and when we have to take this matter to court. So, uh, as, as I mentioned, the way things stand now, if, if uh, Congress does authorize a uh, civil enforcement action, you get to court and uh, you're subject to the normal uh, time frames of, of, of any federal court proceeding, but you also have to deal with the fact that Courts are very reluctant to uh, be in a position of weighing the constitutional prerogatives of two political branches. Right? They don't like to be in that position. If they can wiggle out of it in any way, they will try to do that. They can send the parties back to the negotiating table. If they can split the baby. Anything they can do to try to avoid being in the middle of what is essentially, in the court's view, uh, a political argument between the two branches, they will do. But in this case, we have given the president the opportunity to assert executive privilege. The president is the only one who can assert constitutional privilege on behalf of the executive branch. And because the president has declined to do so, there is no need for the court to engage in that kind of balancing. At least that is the argument that would be made. And I think the House would be in the strongest possible position to, uh, to have the court simply say, first of all, is, has, has the committee been delegated the power to issue, to issue a subpoena by the House? Yes, it has. Is this a matter within the, House, within the committee's jurisdiction? Hopefully it will be. Uh, is it pertinent to the, to the matter within the jurisdiction? Again, the courts tend to be deferential to the, uh, to the committees on that. And assuming those standards are met, there's really nothing for the court to do other than to issue an order 
that the agency has to comply. And the fact that we have given so much due process at the front end, at the congressional uh, stage of this, will also hopefully convince the court that this is a serious investigation and not, uh, to coin a phrase, a political witch hunt. So, uh, so, that, so that's the basic theory of this rule. Uh, now, I will mention that the one thing that you cannot do by rule is you can't actually force a court to, uh, to streamline its own proceedings. You can encourage it to do so by taking these issues off the table, but you can't like actually mandate the procedures that the court, the courts follow. There is, uh, but by statute you could, and there is a bill that has passed the House, HR 4010, which attempts, attempts to do or does, would do just that if it uh, passes and is enacted into law. So that would be a good complement to a rule such as this. Thank you. I'm going to be brief um, so that we can get to the discussion phase. And I might even real, yield some time back to uh, my colleague Elise because for anyone who's ever read one of Elise's uh, staff reports or even worse, been the subject of one of Elise's <laughs> staff reports, understands that Elise has plenty to say. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit on why we're considering and why we need something like perhaps what Mike is, Mike is, Mike's proposal that he just laid out or some variation of that proposal. And we're going to focus on the, uh, the something that some, I'm, I'm unnaturally focused on for some reason, and that's the deliberative process, so-called privilege, which I don't believe is a privilege, but that the um, executive branch asserts against you know, your investigative requests uh, constantly. Um, so the best slide in my deck here, and we don't have many, but this is by far the best one. It's, um, so this kind of lays out, it's kind of a wire diagram that shows how civil contempt works versus inherent contempt uh, versus criminal contempt. And uh, we've talked a little bit about the different contempt options, but the reality is, is that it doesn't really matter what path you go, and of course we can't really do inher inherent contempt. I know there are folks, maybe even folks in this room, that wish we still had that option of inherent contempt, but I think we haven't used it for since like 1940 or something. Um, but, uh, but even civil and criminal contempt, as I, I think Mike and Stan alluded to, really are, you know, aren't great options, mainly because they take so long and because the process is is also pretty time intensive. And you all work up on the Hill. I used to work on the Hill. And depending upon who your boss is, your boss may have absolutely no interest spending a lot of time trying to like spend their time enforcing subpoenas. They want you to do the enforcing for the most part. Um, and so we'll talk just for a minute about um, some of the uh, shortcomings of civil contempt. Um, first of all, as, as was mentioned, there's a civil contempt statute for the Senate. There is not one for the House. However, from time to time, the House does use civil contempt, and, and they do so through um, specific resolutions that allow them to do so in specific cases. Um, you know, look, civil contempt can work well if you have a lot of time and if the, the member, the chairman, is willing to sort of play out that or, or run that play until the end. And so most recently, I believe, PSI used civil contempt very effectively in the uh, back page, in their investigation of back page. Um, but it took, it took a lot of time, and it actually ran over uh, from one Congress to the next. Um, you know, one shortcoming of civil, of civil contempt is that it does not apply uh, to contempt proceedings against a current or former executive branch officer for actions taken under color of law. And so there's immediately a hole right in the area where you often need civil contempt, right? It's that an agency, you want to make an individual and an agency accountable for the information that you've asked for and that that agency is not providing, and yet the civil contempt statute has an explicit exemption for exactly what you might want it to, to what you might want to use it for. Um, and then, you know, there's a process, as, as, as you saw on my last slide, uh, and look, once this eventually does get into court, that's when the subpoenaed party for the first time now has the opportunity to, ra to raise a full range of defenses. And look, if that subpoenaed party happens to be the uh, federal government, the executive branch, 
Um, as, as Mike mentioned, courts are, are going to try to find ways not to rule on that mode, not to pick sides between Congress and the executive branch. Um, and, you know, we see that in the, in the sense that we, we, we've rarely seen uh, in at least so, sort of the modern era, I suppose, uh, civil contempt actions against executive branch agencies actually going to a, a, a conclusion. We've had some district court decisions, um, uh, you know, the Myers case, obviously, uh, Fast and Furious, the Lynch case, um, and, but, but we haven't had precedent that goes beyond that uh, recently, at least that I can remember some people in this room, maybe Tom, maybe uh, Stan or others will uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, on the Senate, I'm sorry, on the House side, uh, and I won't dwell on this, but we've seen examples of civil contempt. I mentioned Myers, Stan mentioned Myers, Iran Contra before that. And then, uh, you know, most recently it is the Lynch case. And we'll talk about the Lynch case in a minute, but the Lynch case, the district court decision is, is very troubling for, I think, you know, congressional investigators and investigative entities. Um, and I think through the good efforts of some of the folks in this room, um, we will hopefully wipe that uh, sort of precedent off the, uh, off the books. Um, let's talk just for a minute about uh, executive privilege, because that's, that, that, so this will get us into a discussion of deliberative process. So, um, and I'm going to go directly to uh, the next slide. Executive privilege, really, um, if you uh, follow the reasoning or the logic of the Lynch case and the, the Loving case before it, um, you know, there really are you know, two components to the executive privilege. There is the presidential communications privilege. That's the executive privilege we all sort of, uh, you know, have read about and understand. is not right. And I've been in the minority and I've been in the majority. I've flipped a couple times. I think, you know, that could happen to all of us here. And you start to understand why minority requests are important. And there you need, I think, um, a statute that's going to address not only executive privilege, but should also bu build in some, minor some concerns for the minority. And that's how you build a wide support for that kind of statute, is to think about those things, about saying, no, you know, you can't just ignore minority requests across the board, which is the White House position, and Congress has never really spoken to that point in a unified way. The other thing is the House um, civil enforcement law. The, the Senate has a civil enforcement law, and the Senate legal counsel goes to court, so we're not dependent upon the executive branch, but as Michael pointed out, there's a huge exception when, you know, for executive branch. And I suppose they did that in order to get it through and not to deal with a veto. But it might be time to reconsider. Why do we have that just broad-based exception when it comes to a civil enforcement rule? So the Senate, rule, the Senate law, that's a law, is too weak because it's got this wholesale objection. But what if we modified that or got rid of it in some way? And again, that's getting into that executive privilege area. And why not have a House civil enforcement law as well? And as, a point, as was pointed out by Mike Stern, you can't really simplify or streamline any sort of civil enforcement process in the courts without a law. But you know what? We need the backbone to do a law. And I know that you are trying sincerely to do a House rule because you feel we can't get there, and I respect that, but it's... To me, it's not the solution. We need to have, Congress does the laws. You know, we can do a law. We can find out if a court thinks the solution we came up with is in, within the bounds of the Constitution. I know it's difficult, but that would be my, I've been here 30 years. I've watched it deteriorate over time. You know, to take the time and effort it would take to come up with a bipartisan bill that all of us could support or most of us could support enough to override a veto is worth that very painful effort. So that's my, my two cents. The Senate provision does not allow suit against uh, government officials is that President Carter threatened to veto 
Title VII of the Ethics and Government Act, which was the creation of the Senate Legal Council, if that provision was included, because the Justice Department, again, bizarrely, having suggested a civil enforcement mechanism in the Gorsuch case, didn't want the House and Senate able to run off to court and force compliance on federal officials. So I, I don't know that there was any constitutional, constitutionally grounded objection to that, but that was the political reason. I learned something today. Okay, great. All right, well, we'd like to take your questions now. So I would just ask if you have a question, you can uh, raise your hand. We'll recognize you if you'd briefly uh, just please state your name and affiliation. Uh, keep, uh, refrain from commentary. Keep your questions brief so that our panelists will have uh, plenty of time to share their ideas with you. Tristan? Yeah. Everybody knows what any given committee is doing in terms of oversight. There may or may not be collaboration. Yeah, so the rule as it's drafted now does have a, a point of order that can be uh, raised against the appropriations of a, I believe right now it's the office uh, or department of the uh, senior responsible official who uh, is has been held uh, in contempt or is, is in violation of an order of compliance. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have specifically anything about docking the salary of the of the uh, official. Although that's another thing that has been proposed. It is, you know, I mean, this has been talked about for a number of years, and there are a whole lot of intricacies as far as you know, getting the appropriations committees on board and so forth. Uh, and my feeling is that this is the sort of thing that. If it, if it starts being practiced and it turns out to be effective, then that will have its own momentum. It's sort of hard to like force it by a rule or anything, because even a, put in a point of order, point of orders can be waived. Points of order can be waived. So uh, I think it is a useful, it's one of the useful ideas uh, that uh, can happen if you have a case essentially where executive privilege is being asserted. So you have a constitutional dispute that you don't really want to take to court. You have these other mechanisms. Let me just say um, on the issue of impeachment, which I, I certainly understand Elise's point, uh, I do think, I mean, first of all, just as a constitutional matter, impeachment is much broader, in my view, than treason, bribery. Uh, and a willful failure to uh, comply with a congressional lawful congressional subpoena is a legitimate grounds of, for impeachment. Now, I do think it would be an extraordinary case where you would have that actually used. And I, I don't, I don't want to suggest in any way this would be do, done in a routine manner. But does it hurt if you have a congressional subpoena and the official and the agency is told, you have to identify a senior responsible official, and that's someone who is subject to impeachment. That's in the Constitution, right? I mean, all civil officers are subject to impeachment. So you just require the agency to identify that person, and that person now knows, well, you know, if I mess up too much here, <laughs> if I start being, say, dishonest in how I respond to the subpoenas, or if I just, you know, ignore completely Congress's demands, there's some theoretical possibility I could be held, uh, I could be personally held uh, responsible in that way. I, I don't think it hurts, but I certainly agree. This is not anything like a routine uh, mechanism for enforcing subpoenas. I, I would just point out on the pay docking there's an old case, Lovett versus the United States, which I think casts serious doubt 
on the constitutional ability of the House to, in a sense, impose a bill of attainder on a executive branch official for some infraction uh, on a selective basis. Um, you'd have to you'd have to look at that, I think, before um, you could conclude that that's something that you could put in the arsenal. I'd point out on the impeachment front, we now have a resolution against Rod Rosenstein to impeach him for not providing documents to the House Intelligence Committee. And we had a threat against John Koskinen, who's the head of the IRS, for not complying with the subpoena. So we've already crossed the Rubicon on that. We're not anywhere near getting a proceeding or a process, but I think that's already been escalated. Yes, sir. Take that? Does anyone know? <laughs> uh, so I believe, I mean, it's in the uh, Judiciary Committee, I believe, and um, I think there is interest in proceeding uh, on the issue. I don't think there's necessarily an agreement as to exactly what that the contents of HR 4010 are the right content. So I, unfortunately, I can't. I don't know if anyone's here from Senate Judiciary, but uh, I, I don't know any more than that. But I know that but they are, they are interested. Senator Grassley is definitely interested in this issue of enforcing uh, congressional subpoenas and uh, can be very upset about it, actually. But, On that. Thank you. I'm not an expert on it. I haven't investigated it in great detail. Um, but when you go to a court, courts don't like to get into the internal rules of Congress. And especially if you, it's a rule that pits Congress against the executive branch, I think they feel, I would guess that a court would want it to go through the entire process of each house passing it, the president deciding whatever the president's going to do, and then Congress reacting to that. And I think that would just make it a much more effective law in terms of its legitimacy and authority for a court to say, all right, they've told me i got to do this. Uh, there's still the just disability issues, but if you had something, as this proposal does, it's sort of a narrow way to address that it's the courts that have said this privilege exists um, there's no statute that defines it. It is a common process for Congress to issue a statute to give greater clarity and, and standardization to a court-created privilege. So those are my thoughts. I, I think there would be constitutional objection from the president if Congress attempted to circumscribe his privilege. Now, you know, again, I'm very old, so I remember all this stuff. Raoul Berger, the late great Harvard Law professor after the Nixon case was announced by the Supreme Court, said, you know, the Supreme Court says it's in the Constitution. I looked in my copy. I can't find it. Um, it's an implied constitutional power. I, I don't think the Congress can circumscribe that in a way that's consistent with whatever the case law is. I do think uh, on Michael's uh, excellent analysis of the deliberative process privilege, that they could write a statute that denies agencies the ability to assert that with respect to congressional subpoenas, particularly if it's only a common law privilege. So that might be a better way to attack this, because what's happened is exactly what Michael suggested. The umbrella of, of executive privilege has been extended through you know, slipshod extension to executive agencies where it has no place. Um, and the reason the agencies can rely on that is they know they can stonewall the Congress and put them through the procedures. So 
I think you could address certain things statutorily. I think others would be harder. I'd yeah, like to oh, go ahead, please. Oh, go ahead, Bill. No, you first. No. Thank you. I, I, the only point I was going to make, I mean, I agree with, with Elise and Stan on, on deliberative process. I do think that this is um, one potential weakness of, of what, what we've been talking about today. And that is if, if you know, because part of what we're talking about is that you would force the uh, president to assert executive privilege. And if you're saying that you're going to force the pre president to assert privilege when some assistant secretary at the Commerce Department is claiming a deliberative process privilege, I don't think the president's going to do that. He's going to ignore it, and then we're going to be back in the courts. And so I, I do think a statute that frames the issue from the Congress's perspective may be a better way to approach it. I just had, I, Michael, please. If you, if you. So um, let me try to draw a distinction here between the substance of executive privilege and the process for asserting it. So it's, it would be, I mean, in an ideal world, uh, Congress might pass a statute that defines exactly what executive privilege is, uh, but I don't think we're anywhere close to getting to that world. And I think there's always going to be disputes between the executive branch and the legislature about the contours of that privilege. And I'll just give the example of the Presidential Records Act, where that very issue comes up, because those are records actually from the White House. These are the president's personal records. And when Congress passed the uh, Presidential Records Act, it deliberately did not try to define what executive privilege was, because they, were, they knew there was no way they were ever going to be able to reach agreement with, uh, with the president on that issue. Instead, they set up processes for when and how it can be asserted. And so that's the idea here is not to try to define the, the basic, I, I agree with everyone that if we get to court and the court is trying to figure out whether deliberative process is a valid constitutional privilege or not, we're going to be back in the same fast and furious problem that Michael's already talked about. But if the president has, the question is procedurally, will the court respect the fact that the president has not asserted executive privilege. I mean, it's not a, it's not a uh, bug of this rule that the president's going to be re reluctant to uh, uh, assert executive privilege for the assistant secretary of whatever. That's a feature. The theory is you make the president personally accountable for making that assertion. He will not want to do that, and therefore you will be in court. Hopefully you don't have to get to court too often, but if you do get to court, you'll be in court where there is no constitutional argument as they had in Fast and Furious for asserting uh, deliberative process. So that's the theory. There is no guarantee that it will work, but uh, I think that it's uh, worth the try. I'd like to ask a, a question of Michael and just to engage Michael Stern and Elise on the question, a couple of the issues that Elise raised about the subpoenas, one being committee process flexibility. Uh, and the, the second being the fact that you might have a, an over-proliferation of, of hearings. Could, could you respond to those two issues, Mike? I mean, yeah. uh, it's interesting. I, I, I'll, all I'll say, first of all, at least, I know the Senate and the House are uh, different. Um, this, and, and every committee is different, to be honest, as you, as you indicated. Um, all I can say is we have socialized this with I don't know how many committees in the House, and I don't recall anyone having that as a problem. Um, it, maybe it is. Uh, certainly, we're open to refining it. And uh, but but you know the people who have to work with this every day are the ones who really would, would know best. And, and one and, important feature is you leave it as an option, right? This is not going to be a monolithic. Correct procedure that the entire House would adopt. The committees would be able to keep, if they want, whatever. That's correct. They, yeah, you, so this you, is a supplementary you, pathway. You would use this if you want to use this rule. If you don't want to use the rule, you don't have to. Um, you would, you would, you would uh, use the rule by simply initiating a written document request, citing the rule, and that gets you into the procedures 
and obviously at any time the committee can abandon its uh, abandon its document request or, or wherever it is in the process if it doesn't feel like moving forward. So, it, I mean, there'd, be an, there'd certainly be an element of trial and error in this, yeah. uh, but uh, it does give you a chance to experiment. I mean, even if we think that one day we hope to have a statute on this, we're really a long way from getting there and without some, some practice uh, as to what works and what doesn't work, it would probably be even more difficult. So. Does, the, does the phased construction of the rule help with the problem of like having a, a, a too many hearings in the sense that you have the written request and you have mandatory negotiation at the staff level and there is a lot of kind of delegation there prior to the subpoena even being issued and then even when it is, you'd think you would have more than that. Do you think, is, is there a sufficient culling in that process so that you, it's really you would only have the committee vote after those two levels failed? Right? Is that? Well, yeah. That that that's right. I mean, the the committee would would not. Uh, the first act of the committee would be to issue a subpoena, uh, unless the re so. Uh, I know one of Elise's very valid concerns is to try to build bipartisanship into this. So that is done by saying that the chairman and the ranking member can issue the subpoena after the negotiation phase. Or if they can't agree, then you have a uh, meeting of the committee. So that would be the first time that the full committee would assemble to act on this matter under under the rule. Okay, good. Uh, do we have yes, sir? Questions directed towards the least obviously everyone's been at three two percent um parties. Um are you worried that a system built on bipartisanship, um, such as you can having the uh, committee chair and ranking member agree or piece of legislation that we have to have to focus on a veto. Um, are you, would you be worried that anything that required bipartisan support like that would be destined to fail um, in the current political climate? And then my second question goes to um, your criticism that there would be an inundation of hearings under this proposed rule. Do you think the existence of the rule would be enough to compel agencies not to take Those are two really good questions. Um, I guess the first one on the bipartisanship, there are so few incentives today to have bipartisanship, so we, we've sort of lost that tradition in a lot of ways. On the Senate side, it's still there, and people do it because if you want your subpoena enforced, if you want to get a vote in the Senate to enforce your subpoena, you have to have support on both sides, or you're not going to be able to get the vote to get it through because people in the Senate can hold things up and cause you problems. It's a different structure in the House. The House is majority rule. And so you could get the votes anyway, even if there's no bipartisanship. But I think there's some research showing that Congress is at its zenith in its fights with the executive branch in court when it's a bipartisan proposal that they're trying on a bipartisan basis to get that information. You could say that perhaps the Congress is finding that out through trial and error and painful situations that, you know, if we had bipartisan support, maybe we'd do better in court, but, or get better decisions. But I don't know that people are learning that. And I, I, you know, it's, it's one of those, bipartisanship to me is the whole key to good oversight for a whole variety of reasons. So I would build it in even though it would slow things down and make Congress uh, slower and, and have more narrow requests because you'd have to reach agreement on them. But to me, less is more. So that's my sort of my position on that. I also wouldn't tie the hands of the chair to issue a subpoena. There are reasons for chairs being able to act quickly. I would just urge them to seek the opinion of their ranking, you know, sometimes we have situations where subpoenas are like ranking, learn about it, you know, in the news. And that, that's not a good situation. Um, so I don't know if that really addresses all of those concerns. And then the second one was about the proliferation of hearings. Um, I just know that we got objections to every single subpoena we ever did, and there were a million, you know, objections to all of them. And what we said is, 
guess who decides the chair and the ranking? And they knew we could do that pretty quickly. If it was a very serious objection, we would write a letter with the analysis in it. But that's just a whole lot easier than having a hearing. And I just think in terms of time, uh, resources, if they know they can get a hearing, they're going to want one. If it's in the rules, it's harder to say no as opposed to, look, we've done it this way for 50 years, and this is how we're doing it. As you said, it's it's a voluntary rule, so that's, yeah. you know, but it might make people less willing to use it because in that might they might see themselves as getting locked into having hearings for objections. Yeah, although it's important to recognize this is only with respect to executive branch agencies. So if you were, I mean, I think PSI often issues subpoenas to private parties. Uh, and if you, have, if you have a situation where the chairman and the ranking member agree on a subpoena and they agree on overruling an objection, whether you're in the House or the Senate, if you're do against a private party, they're they're doomed, right? They, they've, got, they've got nowhere to go. Uh, but it's very, this is directed specifically at the executive branch because even if you have that kind of bipartisan agreement, which is very rare, uh, in the case of an executive branch agency, you've got no enforcement mechanism, right? So you still have that problem. Um, so, but I, look, if, this, if the House were to pass this rule, uh, the wise thing to do, it seems to me, would be to use it first in a case where you did have a good deal of bipartisan support, right? That'll put you in the strongest position. You use this once effectively, and then next time the agencies will know, no, we don't want to go down this road, right? I mean, that would be the hope. And so you don't have to have a whole lot of hearings and process, and so you certainly don't want a multiple lawsuits because that's not actually practical for the House and uh, to be filing suits all the time. Um, you need this as a threat that you can use. Well, and the, the subpoenas have become largely symbolic. Um, and so, you know, the press calls me all the time when they say, well, you know, they're going to issue a subpoena. I say, you know, good luck. We'll see you in two and a half years, get in line. Um, it's not like a grand jury subpoena where you wind up in front of the judge in two days. Um, so this, this fixation on the subpoena itself, I think is a distraction from what we're really trying to get at is because you don't want a subpoena fight. You want some compliance so you can do the oversight that you say you, you need. So I, I'm not, I, you know, there's, the subpoenas don't have any magic anymore. The way they, if they ever did, they're, they're pop guns. They go off. And then three years later, you know, maybe we get an answer. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't focus as much on the subpoena as on the process for getting compliance. Except that I would say if, if you knew Stan was able to enforce your subpoena in court, it might be more of a deterrent than other kinds of things. So if you know you, that the counsel for the Congress could go to court for civil enforcement purposes, I think that would have a deterrent effect because they have legal expenses, all the rest of it. But again, that would require a statute, not a House rule, I think. Elise, in the, uh, in the procedure that you suggested, the status quo of letting the, the chair with the ranking member perhaps decide uh, if they're going to accept ob objections, would that be a sufficient enough basis, if, so let's say if they, if they overrule them, to, to do civil enforcement? Could the rule do that? Or would you need, do you need the committee vote in order? I mean, the way Mike has the rule now, uh, the chairman can only issue uh, authorize civil enforcement after the committee vote. I How think you have, have to have a vote so by you the committee and the full though, body. So you, yeah. Could you could you merge the two for it to, to for it to be expeditious? Do it the way you're saying, and then only in cases if they wanted to use civil enforcement. There's a lot of ways to get there. Yeah. And um, I think research would have to be done in terms of what's the case law out there, what are the due process requirements. Um, Certainly for a court, if there's a really big fight between the executive branch and the legislative branch, your best situation is going to have all those votes, but if it's a more minor area, would the court be okay if just the committee voted? I think people would have to think about that. I don't have an immediate reaction. Do we have any other questions? Yes, sir, please.
Yeah, I think the answer to that is to some extent, yes, either through overbreath or trying to make time of the essence when it's not. Uh, or, or, and Elise and I were talking about this, uh, and not clearly not in the case of your committee, at least historically, as I'm aware of it, needing to do more groundwork before you decide what it is you really need and, and, uh, being specific, uh, instead of, you know, the back up the truck theory. Um, I think that avoids a lot of this because you can force the executive branch to respond to a narrower, you can narrow the fight a little bit before you get bogged down in all of this stuff. And so I think, um, and because my experience is there are always people within the agencies who are going to be dropping things over the transom to you, which are going to lead you to where you want to be. And I think you need to use that to narrow and focus so that when it gets to push comes to shove on a subpoena or request under the rule, you, you've already done that. And you're not doing that for the first time after you've made a decision to subpoena the records. And that's, you know, that's a classic John Dingle tactic that works. So I, I would say that might be something that could also assist you. Yeah, I, I agree with Stan. I, I, I would add to that that um, look, you can't let a, an agency sort of smell weakness. And um, this this goes for, you know, investigations of the private sector, too. But the fact is, if you're going to ask for information from an executive branch agency and you're going to, you know, you're and you know you're going to receive objections before you ask, I think, it, you know, in, in most cases, you should be prepared to fight, right? And and the fighting doesn't necessarily, you know, require you to go to contempt. And as we've seen, contempt is 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 often sort of feckless against the executive branch executive branch anyway. But there are other things you do that folks, all of you, do and can do, and that that are effective. And you know, some of that some of them are, for example, you know, make it personal. If you, you know, bring somebody in from the executive branch, somebody specific for, you know, make them a, a you know, a 30, 30 B6, make them a witness on documents, bring them in for a, you know, an, a transcribed interview or a deposition and talk about what they have, right? Make them come in and it, look, it's time consuming, right? That's the problem, right? And you all have other jobs and <laughs> you've got a lot of stuff you have to do. But the reality is, in my observation, the most effective investigations against the executive branch, there are two, two, two manners of effective investigation. One is, uh, you know, over the last whatever, 20 years or so, one is when the, when the committee is just dogged and they do things like, you know, focus on documents and focus on document custodians and bring people in for transcribed interviews and just make the lives of the uh, folks in the department miserable. Um, and they, they respond. Uh, two is when it's, you know, the same party. And, and this goes to the bipartisanship point. Uh, you know, when you get someone of the same party subpoenaing uh, an administration, uh, you get a Republican subpoenaing this administration. Look, when we, when I worked for Collins, we subpoenaed the Department of Defense um, <laughs> during the BRAC process. Not a supporter of BRAC. Um, and, uh, and they were like, yeah, she's never going to subpoena. The, yeah, come on, it's the same administration. She won't do it. We subpoenaed them, and they took notice immediately. Immediately. And uh, look, I mean, so I think there are things that can do, but th that you can do beyond, you know, a process like this. Um, that really, but, but they require a lot of effort. All right, great. Well, I think we're just about uh, out of time. I'd like to thank our fabulous panelists and all of you for coming. Great. Also, let me remind you that on Friday, October 19th, in the same place and time, we'll be having another panel discussion on a rule proposal uh, authored by Mort Rosenberg, to uh, establish a revised inherent contempt procedure for the House that would rely on fines instead of arrest and uh, detention. So we'll hope to see you then uh, for another interesting discussion. Everyone have a good day. Thank you very much. <laughs>